Fimo, you've come not only to play uh, Brahms double and the Schumann uh, piano concert, but also to, to perform by yourself uh, a, a Beethoven piano sonata, the Opus 10, number three. And uh, you could have come with any of, of the sonatas. They're all in their own way masterpieces. Uh, what is it specifically, perhaps, about the Opus 10, number three, that touches you? And You know, it's difficult to talk about Opus Tan number three, or about any of the Beethoven works, uh, it has so much has been said about it in the past, and so many things uh, said by brilliant philosophers and and poets about Beethoven. He set a new order in music by writing the thirty-two sonatas. I think that it was a larger-than-life experiment, and. He was a probably, a, and for sure, was a brilliant pianist who wrote uh, the sonatas for, for himself. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> especially, I find personally, especially the early sonatas are the most difficult sonatas to play technically. And he obviously wrote it for himself and he could play it brilliantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're extremely long and difficult. And uh, some of them have three movements, some of them have four movements. and but with all the brilliance, it, they also have an enormous depth and sophistication. Um, and Opus Tan number three falls into a category of um, death, uh, death as well. Second movement is marked Mesto. Mesto basically means mourning somebody. Mm -hmm. It is one of the most beautiful second movements. It's, I mean, every slow movement of Beethoven is beyond description, beautiful. And this one has a very, very special place because I think that's the only Mesto that I can think of in Beethoven. Yeah. And uh, it's an amazing uh, moment. It's a miracle uh, for me. I think he's mourning a friend. Or, but in general, I think it's one of the greatest works of all times. I think that um, it is just the whole piece of the most amazing uh, piece in, in every way. Uh, it's also difficult and it's philosophically, it's uh, uh, quite unique. The transformation from movement to movement is uh, incredible. And there are many different ways to look at it. Uh, and I remember a story of that Daniel Barrymore told about the last moment of this piece, that when he was very young, he attended the master class of Edwin Fisher, I think. Mm. And Edwin Fisher was talking about the last moment as the most humorous piece by by Beethoven, because it starts, and there's a break. It's like a joke. And he was trying to convey that message to a student that played for him. And they tried many times to just to bring out this humorous um, qualities of this movement. And then many years later, he met with Claudia Rao and they went out to dinner. And Claudia Rao in the middle of dinner decided to talk about this piece and he said, this is last movement is the most tragic <laughs> movement. Said, I said, why? Well, can you imagine the melody being interrupted? You know, because you know, ta -ta -ra -ra, ta -ra -ra, as if somebody is trying to stop you from singing. You know, mm. that's just, I'm, what I'm trying to say. The point is, it's this piece has so many different directions and ways. Um, I think it's a sign of greatness, you know, it's not, uh, it's uh, really is a miraculous piece. And I think that uh, um, also less played than, let's say, the next sonata, Pathétique. The Pathétique. Yeah. You know, somebody also said that if this piece had a nickname, it would be much more popular. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, and the way it ends, it's called, it evaporates, you know, it doesn't, end, doesn't end with a big bang like a lot of sonatas but it just disappears mm. and uh, melts, you know, it's really like a mirage in a way. 
you know, so that's uh, just a few words about this sonata. Let me just ask another question. I mean, it's fantastic what you just said, but, but it would interest me, and perhaps if there's something you can say about it, that I, I remember when we played Mozart, I think it was the 491, and, and you, could, you, you were asked to play Mozart relatively, not little, but you know, in comparison to the big ones there, and, uh, and you, said to, you said to me, you know, like, what do I do? I have nothing to say. You, your usual beautifully self-effacing way. But when I think of Mozart, I think very often of answers to questions that art poses. And when I think of Beethoven, I think of questions, I think. And I, I wonder when you perform a work such as this Sonata, the Opus 10, number three, is there a narrative in your head? And you can perhaps repeat this question in the sense of, you know, just including this. Is there a narrative? Are there, are there more questions than there are answers? And I realize that's subjective, but I'd be interested if, if, if that's something, when you are performing it, is there this feeling of a story and it is more about questioning, you know, questioning life, what's the point, this, that, and the other? You know, I think that um, Beethoven is so deep that there are new questions every day about how to play his music. Um, and it does not necessarily mean that you find an answer. I think that he had, uh, he was such a genius that it was also hard to, like a great philosopher, when you read him even many times over, it's, you just, you, you, it takes many years before you start to understand a fraction of that. Do you know what I mean? And, and then, you realize that the same philosophers they begin to contradict themselves. And I think there's always that conflict and friction in Beethoven's music that, you know, you, you say, well, this, this is this way, but then on the other hand, he did something else, the next phrase, and it's, it's in conflict. It's like, it could be a question and answer, but it could also be an argument of higher powers interfere, you know, and I think that there's so much mystery. I think he was, you know, preoccupied with universe. He was, um, I remember Leon Fleischer, who recently passed away, unfortunately, a great, great man and one of the greatest musicians of all times, a giant musician. He always said to me that when you play Beethoven, you are part of universe and when you play other composers, he brought some Russian composers, I don't want to name them, he said, universe is part of you. <laughs> so, and I now begin to understand what he meant. When you play Beethoven, you, you don't feel that you're in the center of it. You feel like you are part of something much bigger. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, that's what's fascinating about Beethoven. And, you know, every, every musician, every composer after Beethoven always looks to Beethoven because in a way he was the most modern composer of all times. You know, even all the composers that I meet and I work with and, you know, they write music to me, they always bring out Beethoven, you know, as a reference, you know. It's like, um, it's a new order in music. There's, and there's always this um, conflict and fight and and then um, you create something new. That's where we are in life, you know. Right now we have a lot of conflict and, and then I think we'll come out on top of it somehow. But we have to go through the process. And that's what's Beethoven, I think, also mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm.